Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm so happy to see everybody here today. Welcome to our Legacies of Coal in Search of a Just Transition event. Uh, my name is Brianna Meyer. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the Environmental Solutions Initiative. It's OK. It's OK. <laughs> um, and I uh, was hired to start up and lead our newly launching climate justice program. So I'm very happy to be here today. This is the first of two events this week that are marking the public launch of our program. Um, so in addition to this event, as you can see on the screen, we have another um, launch, public launch event planned for this Thursday. So you could grab the QR code there if you want to. Um, and we invite all of you to join us for, for this event. So I'm going to talk just a few minutes about the Climate Justice Program and then hand it off to the other speakers. So the goal for the Climate Justice Program is to serve as an institutional home and source of support for climate justice work across MIT. We are aiming to create an institute-wide, cross-disciplinary, engaged research and teaching agenda focused explicitly on urgent topics related to climate justice. So our program emphasizes co-designed research that grows from specific frontline community needs and priorities. We are developing long-term partnerships with climate justice leaders, the public sector, industry, and other researchers to demonstrate how community academic partnerships can support co-production of knowledge and real-world solutions. So our program addresses ongoing legacies of harm and advances systemic changes in support of more equitable and livable futures. We extend our lens to the non-human world as we grapple with how to address past, current, and future harms to nature and devise ways of living that support the biodiversity of life on Earth. For example, one of our primary projects this year is in partnership with an organization called Cecila, which was founded and is led by members of Lummi Nation, Yakima Nation, and other tribal groups in the Pacific Northwest. Cecila leadership is advising us as we build out this program, and we are also working with them on a design research project to share indigenous worldviews through virtual reality programs and an eventual Coast Salish Heritage Center in the San Juan Islands. So one of the founding goals of this program is to focus at the intersection of two sometimes historically divergent fields of environmental justice and just energy transitions. So we are especially grateful for our invited guests from Greene County, Pennsylvania for working at this intersection and being with us today. So thank you to Tanya, Mike, and Veronica for being with us. <laughs> yeah. Your work is really inspiring to us, and we're really grateful to be working in partnership with you and learning, learning from you. So we're looking forward to continuing to work together. And I want to just invite everyone here to join us in shaping this program as we move forward um, with this important work. So a few acknowledgments before I hand, um, hand over the podium. First, I'd like to thank the Climate Nucleus for providing funding support for this event. And I'd like to thank the Department of Anthropology for co-hosting the event, and especially Amy, Professor Amy, Amy Moran Thomas for moderating the event. Um, I'd like to thank Yaron um, Huff, our research assistant uh, at the ESI, for all of her work uh, and for all of her work planning this event. And lastly, um, I'd also like to recognize Erin Kroll and Bethany Costanzo for um, pulling this all together. So with that, I'd like to hand over the podium to our ESI director, John Fernandez. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's really, I'm kind of All right, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thrilled to have you here. Um, Anya, Mike, and Veronica, thank you so much for, for being here. Thrilled to hear, to have the opportunity to hear your perspective. Veronica, welcome back to MIT. Um, and also thank you, Professor Amy Moran Thomas, for, for, for being the lead today. Um, I take every speaking engagement that I have an opportunity to, to opine um, to you. I take advantage of delivering the following message. So we work in climate change um, and, and the many 
aspects of climate change. Brianna has already mentioned, we also focused on the non-human world. So m first point I want to make is that there is no addressing climate change without addressing um, the loss of biodiversity. This is a key feature of many of the things that we do. And there's no addressing those two without addressing climate justice. Let me be a little bit sharper in my comments on, on this. Um, the being able to engage science and engineering and design and business uh, knowledge here at MIT with the stakeholders and right, rights holders in, in the world is going to require that we have contributions on how to address climate change, enormous appetite for what do I do, you know, how do we move forward, that we also address the places where people live. One of the key memories I have, Veronica, I don't know if you remember this, but when you were taking me around, you emphasized how Green County, which is an industrial landscape, huge conveyors, coal processing plants, the whole county is essentially one large factory. This is what I came away from. But you emphasized how there's extraordinary biodiversity. The birds that you remember growing up as a child that were there, the sort of biodiversity and birds, and, and the forests and everything else. And there is a, in Greene County, there's a coupled set of um, issues and priorities that link how to deal with transitioning away from coal, fossil fuel-based, hydrocarbon-based fuels, towards a minerals-based economy, minerals-based meaning all those minerals needed for renewable energy, coupled to the effect on biodiversity, long wall mining in Greene County literally compromises the ground under your feet. It, the sub subsidence of, the, of soils uh, compromises housing foundations, uh, it uh, evacuates streams, um, and ponds, and there are a number of situations there. And, and so the coupling to the natural environment is absolutely intimate. And we're moving towards a world where renewable energies are exploding. The need and the, to be able to supply the capacity that we need to address climate change, renewable energy, you need a vast expansion in mining. Coal is just another one kind of mining. To be able to do that, we need to anticipate the climate injustices that are going to come by way of mining activities in the United States, internationally, and elsewhere. It's not only current mining activities, but expansion of mining activities. And so the climate justice program is not just about what engaging with communities on very particular issues of equity in the place they are, it's about this broader set of issues. So I'm, that, I'm trying to make that connection in the full scope, in the, in the full breadth of what the climate, just, the climate justice program means at MIT because what we have intended to do with this program, and I think we're already successful and we're really excited about the coming months, is for this program to be additional to other climate justice programs around the country and around the world. That's really what we, we don't want to crowd the field, we want to be additional. And MIT is a unique place, there are unique people here like Amy Moran Thomas, and people that can contribute in, in a unique way. So that's the sort of the, the setting for why we've launched the climate justice program. And please join us in the coming months, um, yourselves and your, your, your larger networks, your, your networks for engaging in what we're doing. So now just a couple of thoughts on how we um, got engaged or be, be started to become engaged in Greene County. And it was literally one of these um, sitting in my office and um, coming across a, a New Yorker magazine profile of Veronica um, and, and the description of Greene County and the very challenging situation that they were already in and were facing with coal companies scaling down and even leaving that region. What, and the question came, and the question was posed in that article and was the basis for us, it was basis for me cold calling Veronica and saying, we'd like to come down and see what we might be able to do. The question being, what, what will be the effect economically and otherwise on these communities, in that particular community, when coal companies um, uh, 
pick up their operations and leave. Um, and we know that's been happening in various places in the country. And since then, um, we formalized the work. It became one of our projects under a, the project that we call Here and Real, the climate, climate change and the energy transitions is here and it's real. And um, from there on, we um, expanded the work, and that's how Yiran get involved, and a number of other students. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to leave it at that because I know that Laura Fisher, Laura Hesse Fisher, is going to pick up the story of how we're working in Green County. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Lar Hesse Fisher. I'm the director, program director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative, and I'm here to set the stage a little bit more about our engagement in Greene County as I led this effort for a few years and then have passed it off into the very capable hands of Brianna and Yaron. Um, so um, uh, I joined ESI to lead Here in Real, as John had mentioned, which is a project dedicated to directly engaging in regions in the United States that are dealing with a low carbon economy, that transition, and with climate change. And so we do that through working with local and state leadership and community organizations and leadership and newsrooms. And we combine what we have here to offer here at MIT in terms of research with the local values and the knowledge of communities that are on the ground facing this. And so um, something that's very important for us in our approach with Here and Real, but really it's across all of ESI is, we're not stomping in being like, hey, we're MIT, this is what we know, this is what you should do. It's a lot of learning both ways. And we're really looking at how we can empower and equip the communities that we work with as they make decisions about how to move forward um, in, their, in their region. So you're gonna hear a little bit more about Green County. Um, and I'm not from Green County, so you know we have the we'll have the people who are from Green County talk the most about it. But I also know that Brianna and Yuran had asked for you to send some photos. And so just pay attention. Um, later on in the program, you'll see a slideshow of photos from Green County, so you'll get a sense of what the place is really like. But just to lay out what we're talking about here, um, Green County is a roughly 36,000 person county in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania, and it's bordered on two sides by West Virginia. And it sits across, atop a vast coal bed, coal bed that stretches from Alabama to northern Pennsylvania. And this has been one of the top coal mining locations in the United States. In fact, 40% of Pennsylvania mining occurs in Greene County. And uh, coal mining companies and other um, fossil fuel extraction companies hold a significant presence and are a major contributor to the local tax base in this region. So eight out of the top 10 taxpayers in the county are from the extraction industry. And um, so we uh, had been working through the connection that John had made closely with Veronica and um, the Center for Coalfield Justice, which he represented, and, um, and also community leaders like Mike Belding, who we'll hear from later. And um, based on information that they had shared with us, we actually had two students go to Greene County and start investigating the relationship between tax revenues from coal and the impact on school districts and school districts funding. And so, um, these students spent time in the region working with the lo local tax office and really digging through a lot of the data to understand this. And the key findings from their research was that there are school, local school districts whose budgets significantly rely on coal tax contributions and that these are dramatically, in some cases, declining. So just to give you an example of this, there's one school district whose tax revenue in 2018, 64% of it was from mineral value taxes, which is related to the coal industry. And um, in this, in, in Central Green School District, mineral values decreased by 44% um, from 2010 to 2018. And when you kind of do the math and look at how it impacts the school district, that leads to almost a million dollars a year of lost revenue. So these, this is very significant, especially for, um, um, well, for any region, this is a, an, an incredible uh, change. Um, and the prospects weren't getting any better. Um, there wasn't another industry that was coming in to supplant these revenues. Um, and the options were, um, were few and far in between and needed to be investigated. So um, there, are, there are two students, uh, so Mimi Wahid and Caroline Boone, worked with the Center for Coalfield Justice to include these findings in CCJ's door-to-door -door canvassing and in a workshop that they ran with community residents. And we also 
worked with you and helped to design that game that, you know, that worked well enough, right? Um, that they ran at three county fairs over the summer. And um, Veronica, you told me that you estimated maybe about 1,600 county residents had interacted with that data um, over, the, over the collaboration that we had. And then we brought in a, a brilliant grad student, Caroline White Knuckleby, who's still engaged with the ESI. And she, um, after all of that community engagement that we did, we decided to do, put it into a more formalized white paper. So um, a little bit maybe reversed of how research is traditionally done. I did the community engagement first and then the academic exercise afterwards. Um, and, and Uran will be speaking a little bit about that white paper, and we really looked at, um, took the analysis that Caroline and Mimi had done to the next level, as well as looked at, well, what are some of the options, and how could the shale gas industry maybe supplement some of this or not, and what the future has in, in store. And I'll just close by saying that um, we are really, I was really honored to be a part of the Economic Diversification Committee on your county and be a part of that process. Um, I, I saw that as a testament to the collaboration that we had and how we were supporting your county. I thought that was a, a wonderful result and very honored and thankful to be a part of that. And um, we were thrilled to find Duran and have her engage and take the collaboration and the analysis with Green County to the next level. So Duran, please, thank you. Much, that's how much shorter I am than the previous speakers. Okay. Thanks so much for making it out here. Thanks so much, especially to my advisors and supervisors, Brianna, John, Lore, for providing the context and background and support for my work. So I'm a second year master's student in the technology and policy program, and I've been working with Southwestern Pennsylvania since just before I started with TPP. I started in early 2021 as a researcher on the Roosevelt Project. The Roosevelt Project is headed by former Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, um, and takes an interdisciplinary look at the deep decarbonization pathways in the United States. I worked on phase two, which is four case studies in the US, and it developed uh, regional action plans in collaboration with local partners uh, on the ground, looking at you know, social, economic, workforce, cultural, historical, all sorts of factors. Namely, these are uh, the four case studies are Detroit Heartland, so autom automotive manufacturing communities, Gulf Coast, New Mexico, and 13 counties in Southwest Pennsylvania. I worked on the latter two. As part of our work, we conducted interviews with people in the area. So that's government, industry, community organizations, nonprofits, and academics. We also got connected with others doing research in the area, and that's how I found Laura's work. Um, since Roosevelt Phase Two was wrapping up just around when I was starting at TPP, uh, I reached out to ESI and asked if I could join the work, and I'm so lucky, honestly, that I was able to hop from Roosevelt to ESI and continue gaining a deeper understanding of the region. So I'm gonna take inspiration from this talk from one that I heard at a conference once. I'm gonna give you a spoiler from the middle. I'll rewind and tell you how I got there and then explain what it means going forward. So here's the spoiler. Every conversation I had was ultimately about conceptions of home. Every topic brought up economic diversification, environmental effects from fossil, workforce issues, tax base issues, education, planning, housing, activism, all of it circles back to what it means for Greene County to feel like home. Now, Greene County isn't my home, to be clear. I've never actually been. The closest I've come are Allegheny, where you know Pittsburgh is, and Westmoreland and Beaver counties, all sort of within a county or two of Greene. Um, I started this research in 2021 in the midst of the ongoing pandemic, and due to health and safety and financial and logistical constraints during this time, I made a lot of phone calls and scheduled a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, to my 14 interviewees who collectively carved out 40 plus hours of their days to welcome me into their homes and explain their homes to me as best they could and tell their stories, there is no way to fully express how grateful I am. So about a year ago, I started my research with only a really vague understanding of the interstate and regional economic situation. Colon decline, population slowly declining, wealth in the region concentrated in the you know, cities, urban areas like Pittsburgh that pivoted towards high-tech industries like biomed or advanced robotics. And a vague sense of wanting to understand how this rural county was thinking about economic transitions and their future. To understand their future of the region, how they're thinking about it, it's really important to me to understand its history. The prosperity of this region has been long, largely dependent on the prospects of coal for many generations. Coal mining is a huge part of the culture and identity here. Unprompted, when asked about their personal histories and backgrounds, people will mention family and ancestors who are coal miners as a way of demonstrating their deep ties to the region. 
Now, as Laura sketched out for us, this tax structure is such that a lot of the public infrastructures are suffering from the loss in value of these coal assets. As Mike once told me, there is a regional saying that goes like this, as coal goes, so goes the county. The wealth from coal ensured the stability of this region and enabled generations to build their homes and communities around this guarantee. Those former heights of prosperity are diminishing in very tangible ways. The oil and gas industry has not stepped up to replace the loss in tax revenue intake, nor the loss in jobs, nor has the industry provided funds for remediation of the land it has damaged. What does it do to a community when the industry that provided for it for so long begins to fade? To begin with, I had this idea of asking people what they thought of a hypothetical investment scenario to see if residents as a whole might be more interested in manufacturing jobs or reskilling programs or something else. I scrapped this method really fast. My earliest meetings were with the Economic Diversification Steering Committee, convened by the Just Transition Fund, which is a national nonprofit that leverages public and private funds to accelerate just economic transitions through place-based economic strategies. The committee has been meeting since sometime in 2020, um, born out of early conversations about moving the county away from the deep dependence on coal that we've just been discussing. The players on the committee are many, and from a wide range of stakeholders in the county. This is where I first met Mike, and where I made my first impressions, that he's a straightforward, pragmatic, action-oriented kind of guy who dove straight into the issues, taking charge of uh, topics on the agenda, such as sewage and broadband infrastructure developments, and providing top-down perspectives on project forecasts. This is where I first met Julie, an astonishingly proactive and well-informed businesswoman who chairs the planning commission for the county, and Nick of CCJ, who messaged me privately during that first meeting, um, and offered to catch me up on the who's who of the participants and give me some background for what the work they'd been doing. And Veronica and Jonathan and Mahal and others I've since made connections with. Soon after I started sitting in on meetings, JTF stepped away from this convening role in these conversations. And instead I reached out to many of these mentioned members of the committee who directed me to talk to still more people, all working on various aspects of county health and public engagement and growth. Instead of discussing favored industries for hypothetical investment or skill sets that are or aren't transferable between industries, I find myself talking about family. Veronica unpacked for me the nuances within Greene County, how and why her family moved from west to east. Jeremy told me what his cousin's been telling his kid about what a good job means in the future. I find myself talking about home. Mahal looked for jobs that would allow her to move back closer to home to come back and support the community she grew up in and to grow her family here. Mike came back home after about 30 years in the military so his kids can graduate from the same high school that he attended, and so he lives about a mile and a half from his dad's place. Tanya reminisced about a time when Greene County was more populated, when more young people stayed. Multiple conversations have brought up damage to the land and the rivers from coal, to forests and hills from drilling activities. The passion that keeps people around and that brings them back, the scarring of the land, the thriving businesses remembered from childhood, the desire for former heights of economic prosperity brought in by hard work and healthy communities, giving back to the place that raised you where you want to raise your family in turn. This is the underlying heartbeat that I hear. The residents of Greene County are trying to forge a way to bring their community to a place where everyone who considers the place home can stay home, can build that home for their kids, can rebuild everything they remember and love about that. What that means is a little different for everyone. Home and identity are often associated with coal, yes, but I've been hearing love for something more, perhaps something deeper than that. Tanya tells me she looked for jobs that would allow her to stay where she grew up because she never wanted to leave home. I asked what that meant, and she told me that home was about the people, hard work, and resilience. Nick and Ken told me about the region's deep ties to the land, love of the environment. Jonathan wasn't born and raised in Greene County, but spent a couple formative years there as a kid and came back as an adult because he had felt a sense of community there, a sense that people cared. Not everyone agrees on how to move forward either. Some believe in a model where a large investment sparks other service industries to move in and build out an economic base. Others believe in more grassroots endogenous models where residents build their own way out. I hear tensions between those who believe in the benefits fracking has brought uh, to some residents through royalties and those concerned about lack of fresh food and clean water. Another thread I keep pulling on is how to make people work for their own homes. Township supervisors and county level supervisors don't always see eye to eye. Uh, the state representatives are often, on both parties, beholden to uh, fossil fuel industries. 
From an outsider's perspective, I can hear that each of these community leaders working in official capacities or as friends and neighbors is fighting for the health and well-being of their home. And it is a fight, to be clear. Working on education and quality of schools and training programs for high schoolers, planning for long-term changes in housing and roads, and encouraging business development within the county. Every system is embedded in every other of these systems. The decline in the value of the coal and the need for other regional investment is set as a backdrop to every conversation I've had, and systemic cultural change is really, really hard. I came in an outsider, and I learned to listen and to hear. I hear and listen, and right now, I can help lift, lift and amplify the stories that I've been trusted with. I believe this is the beginning of the role prestigious research institutions can play in these contexts, where we engage with communities and forge long-term relationships. I'm so glad our guest speakers could make it out to MIT for this event. I'm really excited for what we can learn together and what we can build together. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. We are gonna take a short break for lunch. So if you haven't already, uh, please take a few minutes to grab some food um, and drinks and let's reconvene at 12. 10 and we'll move into actually hearing from <laughs> the guest speakers and and amy so thanks a lot please stick around and, and help yourselves to the food in the back